a uh, very good evening to one and all and on behalf of the organizing committee of the sixth lecture workshop on transdisciplinary areas of research and teaching by shanti sarovatnagar awardees i would like to welcome the speaker for today professor subhi jacob george who is the chair of the new chemistry unit faculty at school of advanced materials jawala nehru center for advanced scientific research bangalore who has kindly agreed to deliver a talk in this particular online workshop and the topic he'll be discussing with all of us today is the bio inspired reaction coupled supramolecular polymers and before inviting uh, professor george to deliver his talk let me briefly introduce him to all of you he is currently leading a supramolecular chemistry group at the new chemistry unit of the jncsr Jawaharlal Nehru Center for Advanced Scientific Research, Bangalore. He has obtained his PhD degree at the National Institute for Interdisciplinary Science and Technology, 2004. During 2005-2008, he has been a postdoctoral fellow at the Laboratory of Macromolecular and Organic Chemistry, and at the University of Technology, Netherlands. He is the recipient of the Shanti Swarup Bhattacharya Prize for Science and Technology in Chemical Sciences category for the year 2020. He is also the recipient of the Swarn Jayanti Fellowship from the Department of Science and Technology, Government of India, in the year 2017. The Asian Photochemistry Association Young Scientist Award in the year 2015, the Nasi Scopus Young Scientist Award in Chemistry in 2015, Chemical Research Society for India Bronze Medal in the same year, and Material Research Society of India Medal in 2013. In 2019, he has been elected as the Fellow of the Indian Academy of Sciences. He was also the Young Associate at the Academy. in year 2011 in 2021 he received the cnr rao national prize for chemical research from crsi and as a recipient in 2020 he has also become the fellow of the royal society of chemistry his current research interests focus on functional supramolecular polymers living in non equilibrium supramolecular polymerization and supramolecular chirality and organic optoelectronic materials with these words i now invite professor george to kindly share his screen to deliver his talk yeah thank you may, may i share the screen mr sixen yeah please go ahead can you see it uh, yes absolutely fine yeah so uh, good evening uh, everyone uh, so uh, very happy to be here and to be with you in this evening so before i start let me uh thank professor uh, manu saxena for uh, inviting me here uh it's very happy to see that a wonderful uh, lecture series like this is organized uh, with uh, on diverse topics and with experts from various fields i'm sure it is very uh, beneficial to many of the students and participants so uh, thanks professor saxena uh, so so good evening everyone once again uh, so i'll be talking uh, next 40 45 minutes uh, some of the Uh, research uh, activities going on in our group uh, so i know that the audience is quite diverse so i will try to take all of you along with me uh, because the kind of topics is bit uh, complicated uh, so for the non experts but i will try to take all of you along with me uh, so as you can see that uh, there is a nice uh, video it's an animation going on here uh, so this is the kind of materials which i'll be talking about uh, during my uh, talk today and these are called uh, supramolecular polymers uh, so all of you know that uh, all of you know about polymers right we cannot imagine a world without polymers polymers are everywhere it has become a kind of uh, as part of the essential part of our daily life uh, but then uh, so we know that polymers are very large molecules right i'm um, like they are built up with repeating units like if you take just polyethylene terephthalate pet bottles they are very large Yeah, they are called macromolecules. They are very large molecules, and which has repeating units, uh, which is connected by covalent bonds. So, as a result, we also know that polymers is becoming a kind of big threat to uh, our like a kind of society because uh, because most of them we cannot degrade them. So, degradation of the polymers is a big challenge, and it leads to many environment issues. so uh, during the last 20 years or two decades there is a kind of new class of materials which has been uh, uh, discussed a lot uh, uh, is something called uh, supramolecular polymers 
So supramolecular polymers, as you see, that this is a just to get a feel of it. So these are the individual molecules or it will let us monomers. They come together through some very weak interactions, uh, like most of the interactions are inspired from biological structures. That's why I call it as a bio-inspired. So like a hydrogen bonding, pipe stacking, there are much weaker interactions compared to the covalent bond. Think about these monomers come together and form this polymeric chain, the long chain by weak interactions. One can easily imagine that it will be completely reversible because we can easily break them because they are very weak interactions. So recyclability, we can think about a kind of circular economy uh, kind of things like we can completely recycle these monomers. So this was a wonderful proposal like it uh, going on for the last two decades and uh, many groups in the world are working on the realization of these supramolecular polymers. That means the polymers which are completely reversible and they are made up of these kind of very small monomers which are linked together by weak interactions. So another advantage if you think about these kind of materials is, uh, so you see that there is a lot of dynamics happens. That means monomers, the molecules goes and out of this polymeric chain, right? So this dynamics uh, also gives you a lot of advantages. For example, uh, suppose there is a damage uh, in your material and this dynamics help them to self repair that material, right? So it's, it's, uh, it's, it's exactly like what happens in nature. So self repairing or self healing. So we can think about many such advantages if you make a materials, a polymeric materials with this kind of weak interactions. They will be completely reversible so that it can recycle at some point of time. And also they can, we can even easily self heal them or self repair. So these are all nice uh, properties, right? So how do you make these materials? That's something which I've been talking about it. Uh, uh, so you can see that and uh, supramolecular chemistry, I will come to that very soon. How do we make it and what are the challenges in this field? So before I go into that, uh, we have something called supramolecular chemistry laboratory uh, at Bangalore. Uh, we work with a lot of synthesis, uh, synthesis making new molecules and try to organize them. Uh, like as I shown them by weak interactions, we try to organize them to make a materials out of it. And uh, uh, so various kind of materials we work on. I'm not going to go through all of them. So I will be talking only one part of uh, today's our, our interest that is about the uh, dynamic supramolecular polymers. I'll come back to that in detail very soon. So we also have some other uh, activities like making uh, chromophoric molecules for organic optoelectronics and so on. So I'll not be touching upon on those aspects. Okay, so uh, let's come back to the basic question of supramolecular chemistry. And uh, we all know that supramolecular chemistry, uh, like it's a, it's a very nascent field, probably three decades or four decades. And it has been defined as the chemistry beyond the molecule. Uh, that means uh, uh, this is all about not a single molecule. This is an ensemble of molecules held together by weak interactions, right? Uh, so it, it, it's an assembly of molecules. And so organization is an important uh, factor here, how they are organized in space uh, and time. Uh, so this is, uh, so the most of the inspiration when you start a supramolecular chemistry, people say that it comes from the cellular world. Because if you look into the cellular world, it is not always about single molecule. It's always... Uh, and as ensemble of molecule which performs functions in a cell, right? Uh, so if you take examples like uh, our cell membrane, which is all lipid bilayers, you can see that it's an assembly of molecules, not single molecules. It is just like a bilayer assemblies of lipid uh, kind of systems. Or even if you take a DNA, DNA is not a single molecule. It has two strands which are held together by uh, very weak interactions. So if you look into uh, nature, uh, you can see that it is an ensemble of molecule which performs most of the function. So this is one of the characteristic nature of uh, uh, cells. And if you look into another important aspect of cell is that it's a highly dynamic world, right? So here it is a, a nice YouTube video. You can see that uh, uh, which is available uh, in the YouTube to show you the inner life of a cell. The YouTube tit uh, the title of this video is the inner life of a cell. Uh, to show you how complex is the uh, a cell structure. But I'm showing only one part of that, one clip from that video. It is the microtubules, which is uh, helping in uh, for the movement, right? So these are the microtubules are assemblies of tubulin proteins. But you can see that they are, uh, which provides nice cellular tracks for the movement of the motor proteins. Uh, but if you look into this, you can see that they are highly dynamic, right? They are continuously assembling, disassembling. And this dynamic motion is very important for 
uh, this movement. Okay. So if you look into the nature or cellular world, there are two important aspects you can see that. As I mentioned, it's an assembly of molecules. And this assembly of molecules are always under dynamics. They assemble, disassemble, they assemble, disassemble, right? So this was the motivation for supramolecular chemists to make materials which has the properties like, uh, like the cellular world, right? So if you look into back, uh, so these are the Jean Mary Lennis in 1980s, 1987, uh, they got the Nobel Prize. So when they started with the supramolecular chemistry, they started with very simple molecule, uh, which are host molecules, which can bind to guest, right? So this was a very discreet uh, molecular entities they were working on uh, at the beginning. But if you look into, that was the beginning of supramolecular chemistry, that again, uh, like a crown ethers and so the people have made molecular complexes which can uh, bind to uh, various gas molecules. That was the beginning of supramolecular chemistry. Uh, but if you talk about like uh, three decades later, uh, people have advanced, we can make bigger and bigger cage structures like that. It is, uh, it's from a Fujita, who was a Japanese scientist. He made such a big, uh, big capsules uh, by assembling molecules. And you can also use it as a kind of nano flask. Uh, so for doing some uh, reactions or stabilizing some uh, products and so on. So you can see that supramolecular chemistry has uh, over the period of like a three decades uh, grown into a kind of, we can call it as like, just like organic synthesis. Now this is a non-covalent synthesis because they are all uh, held together by very weak interactions. As a result, they are completely uh, reversible. So why I showed this slide to convince that supramolecular chemistry has evolved over the, uh, over the last uh, three decades and uh, it's like a kind of uh, you know, molecular engineering. Uh, we can make uh, larger structures and so on. So this is about the first part of the inspiration I'm talking about. That is an assembly of molecules. So now it's no longer a challenge for us to, uh, for a supramolecular chemistry to assemble molecules into various architectures. It's, it's very easy. Huh? Uh, so when it comes to the second part, second part I said, well, it's about dynamics. And all of you know that the recent Nobel Prize in 2016, again, uh, went to three, these three gentlemen, uh, so, uh, like uh, Solvage, uh, Stoddart, and Ferenka, so for something called molecular machine. So molecular machine is, is it was an attempt to mimic the dynamics part of the nature, right? Can we use molecules to perform movement? Uh, can they make movement? And if they can make movement, can they perform work? Huh? So they work with very simple uh, molecular systems called catenins and protections. This is not the topic of today's discussion, so I'm not going to go through it. But what they're trying to do again is to mimic this, uh, uh, like a bacteria, bacteria flagellum or this canicin uh, motors and so on. So they were trying to mimic this motion uh, in synthetic molecular systems, and they were came up with very interesting molecular systems like uh, that, like a kind of molecular cars which can be probed by uh, scanning tunneling microscopy and so on. And also, see, this is probably I would consider uh, this 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 particular video as the first demonstration uh, that these molecules can indeed perform work. So what they have done is they, uh, especially from Fringas work, they have done a, made it like a nice monolayer of. Uh, light sensitive molecular machines and they put a kind of uh, small rod on top of it and they shine light you can see that the rod starts rotating because of the uh, molecular rotation of the molecules uh, so this is wonderful right i'm like this is uh, this is although this nobel prize was highly criticized by people many people saying that there is no real applications of this particular field but this was a now what given to the creativity of a chemist where they can make molecules move just like uh, biological systems. So this was wonderful like to hear. So as, you, as I uh, want to go back, so there are two different aspects. One was the molecular organization and the other one is dynamics. And chemists have been trying to address, especially supramolecular chemists have been trying to address these two aspects uh, during the last three decades or so. But then uh, what we are doing. Uh, so if you look into this, this is very at a molecular level, right? Uh, so if you go one step further, if you just go back to the uh, the inner life of the uh, the, the microtubule, uh, you can see that this is the movement uh, is on a, not at a molecular scale; it is at a micron scale, or so it is at the next hierarchical level is involved. So, if you look into this, uh, you see that these are micrometer long objects, <coughs> and uh, they are continuously assembling and disassembling. So, can we make these structures, which is an assembly of molecules, which forms large large structures? And at the same time, they are highly dynamic according to the uh, programming we do. 
probably that's the next level of challenges. And this is exactly what I'm talking about supramolecular polymer uh, as a material. Okay, uh, so let's move on. Uh, so the, we all know that uh, last year was the 100 years of uh, micromolecular chemistry, uh, uh, where uh, Hermann Staudinger proposed the concept of a polymer where uh, these polymers are linked together by uh, covalent bonds. Uh, so see, this polymer chemistry during the last 100 years, it has evolved to such an extent, we cannot think about a world uh, without polymers, right? So the, thanks to the, uh, the, the, the Staudinger and uh, who eventually got Nobel Prize in 1953, uh, to propose this micromolecular science, uh, the science of big molecules or micromolecules, right? Uh, so the last year there were, uh, not last year, sorry, two years back uh, in 2020, there were many programs organized uh, in uh, to celebrate this 100 years of micromolecular chemistry. So because we know that it has huge influence on uh, all of our life. Uh, so coming back to supramolecular polymers. So these are the, uh, this is the dynamic world I'm talking about. Uh, we have to construct uh, structures which are big as the classical polymers, but at the same time, uh, these this monomers are always under dynamic conditions. They go into this polymer chain, come out, go, uh, come out, so that even if there's a breakage here, uh, this dynamics will help to self-heal the material, right? Uh, we have all seen that in movies, uh, like uh, Mission Impossible and everything. So there, you, even if you, if, even if you sell uh, or in a Terminator movie, you see that if even if it uh, the uh, villain break into two parts, it can come back and self heal. Okay? Can we make materials like that? Okay, so this field is very active for uh, last two decades or something like that. And uh, if you look into it, uh, there are many things has to be addressed. And some of the uh, things we are trying to address is like, uh, uh, can we make precision synthesis of the supramolecular polymers? That means precision synthesis is that we should be able to create structures which are well-defined. You say that I want a structure which is one micrometer long, I should be able to synthesize it. Uh, and again, if you look, look, back, to, uh, look back to nature, uh, there is one, of, one more important aspect is there. Okay, so that's what I once tried to uh, talk about it. So this is this is what we have been trying to do uh, for uh, last uh, few years in our lab uh, to make structures which has controlled size. In polymers language, it is degree of polymerization. That means number of monomers unit in a polymeric chain uh, to without uh, much narrow disperse. Narrow disperse is an important aspect. That means if I create a material, all of them should have a same size. That is the way biological structures work, right? If you look into microtubules or DNA, all of them has a precession length. But what happens is most of the time when you make these polymers in lab, uh, they are completely polydispersed. So can we make these structures perfectly? Uh, that is what I call it as a precision synthesis of these polymers, which has controlled size as well as uh, uh, controlled dispersity. That means all the polymeric chain should have the same size. Uh, uh, and also one of the important challenges, multi-component. So if you look into peptide protein structures, there are a large number of monomers which is arranged in a particular sequence, right? So the question is, can we make uh, these structures uh, also synthetically? And something which is, uh, if you look into uh, one of the important difference uh, between the synthetic materials and biological structures is uh, in synthesis, if you make something in the lab, it's always, it's a simple energetic uh, energy landscapes I'm showing for all of you. Uh, so if you look into it, uh, you see that there is a, uh, it's a gives uh, free energy. If you look into it, most of the synthesis, if you do it in the lab, it's an energetically downhill process, right? That means gain in free energy. So we have to, we will always have a tendency to make materials which are uh, more thermodynamically stable, right? So that will be, means it's an energetically downhill process. Uh, so even if you have making a kind of kinetic product, which has a higher energy, with the time, it will relax us back to the more stable structures. So it is an energetically downhill process, or they are all equilibrium structures, right? Uh, but when you look into biological structures, it completely works in a different way, okay? So that belongs to this side of the energy landscape I'm talking about. They are all out of equilibrium structures. What I mean is uh, you need a continuous supply. It's an energetically uphill process. The self-assembly biological self-assembly is an energetically uphill process. What I mean is you have to provide energy for this molecule to exist uh, in the uh, assembled state, in the... Uh, for example, this is microtubules. We know that ATP is the energy currency of biological system. So ATP creates energy, and that is why it is always in a high energy state. And as soon as ATP get hydrolyzed to ADP, energy is released, 
it comes back to the uh, normal state. So uh, if you look into most of the biological assembly process, they are all, uh, what is that? It's an energetically upfill process uh, compared to most of the synthetic systems which make in the lab, which is energetically downfill process. So if you want to really bring adaptive nature, self-healing nature, we need to put our synthetic materials into this regime. We also may have, we have to, we cannot make equilibrium structures. We have to make non-equilibrium, out of equilibrium structures. Then one can make uh, uh, similar materials like biology. That's what I'm talking about, bio-inspired synthesis. If you want to really make smarter materials, uh, we have to go by nature's way. Uh, so this is something is important. Uh, so as we know that out of equilibrium, uh, the, the prionin set, equilibrium is death, huh? right? In biological structures also is something. Like if you, as soon as we come to equilibrium, uh, we, are, we, are, we are no more. So can we make materials which are smarter, which is away from thermodynamic equilibrium and uh, they act as non-equilibrium system? So this is another aspect when you talk about bio inspired, right? So we need to make materials which are dynamic and at the same time, they are far away from the equilibrium so that uh, we can create. And from a material chemist point of view, if indeed, if you can make this kind of out of equilibrium materials, right? Uh, then it gives you, that means what I, what I mean is that you need a stimuli, you need a fuel, uh, which makes these molecules to assemble and form a kind of fiber like this. And then once that stimuli runs out of the system, it relaxes back to the uh, initial material, right? So suppose this is a supramolecular polymer, we can, we'll get back the monomer uh, if there is no, uh, once the stimuli runs out in the system. So this gives you, think about a scenario like this. So that means you are making a transient material. That means you are making a material, from a material perspective, you, you are making a material whose lifetime is defined. You say that this should be stable for one year or one hour and say that it should uh, disassemble to, uh, so it gives you a kind of new kind of materials, something called transient materials. One can imagine uh, from a, even from a functional point of view, one can imagine uh, things like uh, smart, uh, security purpose, like we sh always uh, see in movies after, uh, after uh, delivering the purpose or you deliver the message, the materials should self destruct right? So we can think about various uh, fancy things like that when you think about a transient materials, uh, which is uh, away from the uh, equilibrium. So these are the uh, few things. So uh, we, our lab is trying to do, uh, make a supramolecular polymer, which is similar to the classical polymers. Only difference is uh, they are reversible uh, and uh, they are self-healing. And also they are away from the out of equilibrium so that we really make the bio-inspired synthesis uh, completely. Okay, so that was the, uh, Okay, uh, Professor Saxena, my voice is clear? Yes, absolutely. Okay, because there was a comment in the chat box. So we just wanted to check yes. it. Yeah, yeah, okay, uh, sure. Uh, so uh, uh, so this is, this is the, uh, uh, this is the way uh, we do synthesis in our lab. Okay, uh, so now uh, with this, with this little bit elaborate synthesis uh, introduction, I'll try to see what our, uh, we try to do because I know that this part I cannot go to the detail. So I, I thought I will give you a kind of flavor of uh, where we are heading. Okay, uh, so the question is is uh, the precision synthesis, uh, the structural control. As I mentioned, if you look into the bio inspired synthesis, everything is exactly uh, similar to. Uh, what is that? Uh, by, uh, they are very monodispersed and they are having a very defined structure. When it comes to uh, synthetic material, as I mentioned, uh, since most of them are energetically downhill process, uh, they will have a tendency to achieve the thermodynamically stable equilibrium. So uh, what happens is uh, we know that most of these materials, even if it is for an structure synthesis, it follows, or in a polymer synthesis, it follows a kind of, uh, uh, kind of uh, cooperative manner. What I mean is that uh, there is a uh, there is always an involvement of a nuclei nucleus formation which is generally uh, energetically downhill process and then there is a uh, nonlinear increase in its elongation process then once the nucleation happens uh, there is a lab a rapid increase in the size that's the way most of the nanomaterial synthesis also happen polymer synthesis happen it is called chain polymerization as all of you know and this is exactly true with the supramolecular systems also we have an energetically downhill step and then once it nucleus is formed, it rapidly goes into the system. So what happens is in most of the synthetic system, the energy barrier uh, is not so high for this step. So as a result, what happens is if you, if you are adding another batch of monomers into it, instead of growing its end, 
uh, it will start its own uh, nucleation centers. So that, that kills your control on the uh, length of the polymer. So I, I'm just making it very simple. So, uh, so this is the problem. So we have to we have to do it in a slightly different way. So as a result, most, most of the ways and synthesis, synthetic guys trying to make these supramolecular polymers just like biological systems, uh, we had no control over its structure. Okay, so at this point, what we thought is, okay, forget about the classical way of synthesis, uh, let's go bio inspired way. So again, uh, I ask you to look back to these two videos. Uh, one is uh, the microtubule and it is actin. Actin is another protein. And you see that this is, uh, this is triggered by ATP and this is triggered by GTP binding. So if you look into it uh, in, a, in a chemist point of view, uh, it is a kind of fuel driven assembly. What I mean is uh, the molecules, the, uh, the monomers uh, kind of stays in a kind of inactive state unless it is bind to a reaction or in this case it is the ATP binding or GTP binding, then the monomer changes its shape into a kind of active state. As soon as this active state happens, it assembles into a kind of one dimensional assembly. And once ATP or GTP runs out in the system, it relaxes back to the initial state. So it's a, it's a completely uh, layman's language. This is the way uh, nature works, right? And obviously, the, most of the time, nature has chemical fuels like ATP or GTP binds, uh, which is generated by the protein, uh, various enzymatic uh, reactions, and so on. So this is the way things work. So for a chemist, uh, what are the fuels available? I think we have even more diverse uh, fuels available compared to nature. We can think about obviously the enzymatic uh, reactions as the fuel, uh, or you can think about uh, kind of a chemical reaction which uh, drives the reaction, or a redox fuel, or photofuel. Uh, so there, there is a large number of exactly these are the fuels uh, Nobel laureates have used for the designs of uh, molecular machines as well, right? So uh, we started this uh, long time back. Uh, I now I'm going to uh, some of the. Uh, uh, some of the chemistry. So since it's a diverse audience, I really uh, trying to make it very general. Uh, so the uh, so Mohit in 2014, when we this we when we went when we started this field, can we make like a kind of bio inspired uh, kind of nanofibers? So he came up with a very simple design. These are the kind of uh, molecules we work on. Uh, these are chromophores, uh, right? And aphthalene dimers we call it. Uh, so the beauty of this system is that uh, it we can probe the self-assembly, that is the molecular assembly of these processes by uh, optical and uh, op optical properties, because they are they will have nice uh, optoelectronic properties. So we can use them as a nice probe in characterizing these assemblies, okay? So what we did is just like when by actin or microtubules, we designed this with the two receptor moieties like this. And the beauty of these, uh, uh, these receptor moieties is that uh, they can bind to phosphate like ATP in a specific manner. So that is what exactly we, uh, something similar to actin self-assembly, what we have done is we designed this kind of molecule so that this is an inactive state. As soon as ATP bind to it, like ATP bind to it, it starts forming one time uh, structures. And if they are dynamic, we can introduce an alkyl enzyme into it. So enzyme will hydrolyze ATP to uh, phosphate all the way to phosphate, then it will disassemble. So this was, uh, this was a very, uh, very, very, uh, big design and then uh, it worked uh, beautifully. So what uh, so this what Shiga has done later subsequently that we really wanted to make out of equilibrium structures. So what she has done is uh, she has tried to couple, uh, as I mentioned, this is highly selective to ATP binding, just like acting self-assembly. What she has done is she has coupled this uh, self-assembly process into a kind of enzymatic reaction cycle. So what she has done is uh, she has taken two enzymes, like a creatine phosphokinase, uh, which can create ATP from ADP using like a certain like a primary fuels like phosphocreatin and so on. Uh, and then she used another enzyme hexokinase, uh, so which can uh, hydrolyze ATP back to ADP and regenerate the other cycle. So what she has done is she has used this structure uh, to completely couple to two enzymatic cycles to exactly similar to the bio structures so that we can make transient or out of equilibrium structures. So this was uh, done by Shika. So what, uh, instead of going into the detail, what I'm trying to say that we try to mimic exactly same structure like a microtubule or actin in the, in the biological structures uh, where we can, uh, it is an inactive state. So when a chemical fuel binds to it, it converts to an active state, it starts growing. 
and more importantly we can couple into a kind of uh, kind of complementary uh, en enzymatic cycles so that uh, we can modulate the out of equilibrium structures like that so this was the initial idea uh, and then uh, so we can see that this is a kind of transient structures you see that uh, it grows as i mentioned we can probe it by optical properties because these molecules are highly sensitive to uh, intermolecular interactions and will give characteristic changes in its optical properties. You know? So what happens is that it forms, disassembles, forms, disassembles. Uh, and so you can really make uh, oscillating structures uh, like in uh, nature uh, by doing this, okay? Uh, so what uh, later, uh, uh, what Anania tried to do is, uh, so Anania slightly modified this design. You see that the, the only the middle part is changed into a slightly elongated structure. Uh, so that uh, she, same kind of chemistry, but the beauty is that she really could control the dispersity of the structures. So you can see that this is the dormant state where molecules remains uh, inactive. And as soon as ATP binds to it, nucleus forms and it starts growing. Uh, you can see that this nature of these curves, which uh, we follow the growth process, is exactly similar to actin self-assembly curves, which call it as a cooperative mechanism. I'm not going to the details. So it's a, it's a nucleus formation and there is a non-linear change associated with it. So uh, this growth process, this is a time-dependent changes. It's We can fit to the same models used in the actin self-assembly and so on. So we are trying to make structural analog of uh, actin structures and so on. Uh, so I will skip it. Uh, so uh, so now we are continuing on various structures. You see that now the, the receptor moieties is now changed to a slightly different thing like a gametinium structures, which can also bind to ATP. Uh, and you can see that pretty similar uh, growth models and this is the distribution of the length that means uh, we uh, we get a nice distribution uh, and if you look into the dispersity which is very close to one uh, okay and you can also have a control uh, on the length so what we could achieve uh, is that to make supramolecular polymers uh, which is very uh, very sensitive to reactions uh, enzymatic reactions and we can make them highly mono dispersive and so on so this is uh, and also we can make it transient cycles, okay? Uh, so we can, as I mentioned, uh, for a chemist, uh, so in, in in biological structures, most of them are enzymatic reaction coupled, but for a chemist, you have various reactions also we can do it, right? So we, we are also extended the similar strategy to now a simple chemical reaction driven assembly, and uh, we, can, we can get similar structures. So just look back to this particular part of it. Uh, always we deal with an inactive state. There's a reaction which triggers converts into an active state, it forms assembly, and then reaction two, which disassembles. So in this case, it's a very simple immune reaction, uh, which also triggers the self-assembly. Please don't worry about it. So we can uh, we can make structures uh, like that. Uh, so uh, I will skip these things uh, because I see the time is running out. Uh, so what, what we could do is right now, uh, as I mentioned, we, we can do chemical reactions or a enzymatic reaction we can make structures uh, which are monodispersed, and as I mentioned, there's out of equilibrium structures. So, uh, what do we do with this out of equilibrium structures? Huh? Uh, so, uh, I'll just just so far the story is like this. Okay. Uh, so, because I wanted to give you two, three different concepts to you uh, before I end my talk, that's why I'm uh, skipping. So, what basically we have done is uh, so far is we are able to make structures uh, which are uh, highly monodispersed. And this is driven by a kind of fuel driven uh, growth process, okay? So we can control the structures and we can also uh, assemble, disassemble uh, by a kind of out of equilibrium manner. So if you if you look into it, as I mentioned at the beginning, it gives you a kind of new kind of material, which is called transient materials, okay? Uh, so you see that this is the lifetime of a material. And just, just by using the concentration of the enzymes or one of the fuels, which can nicely tune the lifetime of a material. So that was, you are pre-programming the lifetime of a material, right? So for example, here you see that it is 400 minutes, 800 minutes, 200 minutes. So this gives an opportunity just to say that we can make a transient material out of it. Uh, so uh, what are the advantage of it? I'm like, we are now trying to think about self-erasing inks. Uh, so you tell, uh, you make an ink uh, with this transient material and you predefine its lifetime. So you say that, uh, let's say after one, one hour, uh, it completely disassembles, right? It gives you a lot of uh, interesting things, right? And also, if you look into it, uh, can we have a transient electronics? Because most of these materials, most of this, uh, the, the fibers we made uh, was made up of uh, biconjugated molecules, right? They're, they're nice uh, 
organic semiconductor molecules. Uh, can we also make transit electronics, right? Uh, so you define the lifetime of it uh, and then the fibers just disassemble, right? So this is something probably like in, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, like in Mission Impossible, it's a kind of self-destructing devices. Uh, you just uh, define the life uh, lifetime of materials. There are a lot of opportunities. So uh, the, our thing was to uh, really work us, uh, follow the, 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 the biological synthesis, bio-inspired synthesis to make uh, structures which are uh, similar to each other. So that was the, that was the objective. Okay, so let's move on. Uh, so, uh, so, so one of the, so far we have seen that we are able to make, uh, uh, we are able to make uh, systems move. Uh, no, not move. We are, we are able to make systems which are monodispersed. We are able to uh, make them controlled way and also we can make out of equilibrium structures, right? So there are, uh, so one of the issues is, but then as I mentioned, uh, I told you, uh, why we need to do this? So if you look into bio inspired, one of the other thing is that they are able to do the movement, right? They are able to, uh, they are able to store energy, huh? right? If you look into uh, microtubules, uh, you know that the, it grows and the assemble, disassembly is a highly, highly uh, catastrophic effect. That means that disassembly happens all of a sudden, right? So can we make materials, uh, and that is very important for performing the function. So the question is next level of challenges, which is going on. Uh, most of the next part is uh, unpublished results, but then uh, I would be very happy to uh, share with you that the way we think. So we are having a control of the structural aspect, uh, the way we are able to make it transient materials out of equilibrium structures. Can we also use these materials to perform a function like like just like a microtubules? So uh, one thing one thing is very unique about microtubules is. Uh, if you look into it, uh, if you look at the energy landscape, uh, so even once GTP get hydrolyzed to GT GDP, it will not disassemble immediately. It has a kinetic bottleneck. So that means energy is getting stored to a certain extent. And once it is reaching a threshold, it will just burst. It is called catastrophic uh, assembly, disassembly. So that is very important for the movement of the, uh, movement of the uh, systems. So the question is, can, whatever the system so far we had designed was this kind of energy storage was not possible. So uh, it's nice, we can make control structures, uh, but from a kind of uh, performing work-wise, uh, we know that molecular machines does it at a, at a molecular level. If you wanted to get, get it at a, at a microscope, microscopic level, uh, how do you do it? So this is something which we have been thinking about it. So we need to store energy in these fibers, right? Uh, even the fuel is uh, consuming, it should not disassemble, okay? So how to do it? So that is one of the uh, next challenge we are now trying to uh, address it. And uh, so we uh, we have an inter-German collaboration. So we have been, uh, uh, again, uh, this, uh, the, you can see that these are uh, sim similar uh, the bioconjugator system. So the beauty of this uh, naphthalene diamonds is that just by changing the atoms uh, attached to this, we can tune the color. Okay, so if it is oxygen, uh, this will be green emissive uh, uh, emission colors. I mean. And if it is like a kind of slightly different uh, with one NH and asymmetrically substituted, it will be uh, red in color. So we we made uh, this kind of uh, big structures which has a peptide moiety uh, attached it uh, here. So what, the, and also we see that there are some groups which are highly sensitive to pH in the system. So what this molecule does, it, it is, this again forms nice one dimensional fibers and everything. So what this molecule does is, uh, uh, what we found that uh, this, this, this pipeline stacking, uh, there is a nice pipeline stacking between these molecules. So even if this, uh, these molecules are deprotonated, uh, that means, uh, if you change the pH, this will uh, this H will go. It will become carboxylate, and there should be a repulsion in the uh, molecules, and it should uh, disassemble uh, by electrostatic repulsion. But these molecules, there is an interactions between them in the fiber, so that will try to hold in the system, despite uh, this is uh, negatively charged and there is a repulsion in the system. So what we found that because of this competition, you see that even if the uh, the repulsive forces overtake, this this will not disassembled because of the attractive interactions between them. Uh, so 
And then once it's disassembled, you can see that this is highly cooperative. That means it's just like a catastrophic uh, disassembly. I talked about a microtubule, just bust. The fibers just bust. Uh, so we try to visualize this with super resolution microscopy. Uh, and you can see that these are the fibers you see that. And you see that the, the disassembly just happens very rapidly. The bust, these are the probing the fluorescence intensity of the fibers, and this just bust. So uh, we were very happy to see these results because uh, it's a kind of catastrophic disassembly that happened. Uh, so the question is uh, can we measure the force uh, generated in these things? So that's very challenging. Uh, there is a nice nature paper where people try to uh, calculate the microtubule, how much force is generated, like a 0.24 uh, piconewton and everything. Uh, so, but what we are trying to do is like we are now uh, trying to quantify the force generated by this uh, catastrophic disassembly and uh, by putting some extra beads and uh, looking into the velocity of these beads and so on. And you see that the uh, system is like a 1.152 piconewton. This is a, a very qualitative number. Uh, uh, we are trying to do it in a better way, but you can see that this is pretty close. So what you see, see, see that uh, we are now uh, trying to push the our research to the next level, not only constructing the system uh, with a, in a kind of very precision manner, uh, can we also extract uh, this out of equilibrium structures, uh, just like uh, bio-inspired design, can we also get uh, some uh, energy storage and uh, kind of, uh, uh, other properties in the system. So this is what something which is, uh, we call it as a synthetic microtubule, but long way to go. So uh, also we can tune the forces by which nature cannot do, uh, by just by clever uh, molecular designs. You can see that uh, the green and red molecules differ slightly uh, in terms of the force generated and so on. So this is uh, this is a way. And uh, one more one more bigger challenge is like uh, we have to uh, we have to address its sequence because as we mentioned so far. Most of the system I showed was a single component, only one monomer, uh, monomer is involved. So at some point of time, we have to go to multi-component, right? Uh, we should think about sequence controlled uh, supramolecular polymerization. So that's something which uh, we are trying to do now. Uh, we are now extending into two-dimensional structure, but then uh, there are a lot of challenges like characterization uh, because you need often uh, super resolution microscopy and so so many other techniques to uh, to to really uh, visualize them. Huh? Okay, so these are the few things uh, uh, we are trying to push it. So what I uh, so I will try to conclude here. Uh, so almost my time is up. Uh, so what we are we have been trying to do is. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, we were working on supramolecular polymers. It's a kind of new materials. The all I all idea is that uh, I did not talk about it is that these materials are ideal for us. Now people are projecting as recyclable plastics. So we have an activity towards that as well uh, in an attempt to uh, make a real circular economy out of it. Uh, so that part I did not talk about it, but what I was talking to you about is to uh, see how we can have a controlled synthesis of these supramolecular polymers. So that uh, we try to address one by one. Uh, we try to address its structure. Uh, and uh, we were trying to address this non-equilibrium, out of equilibrium structures like a transient materials one we can do. And we are now trying to do the multi-component. And more recently, we are trying to extract uh, really the work out of it um, in terms of its uh, uh, dynamic instability or uh, what you call it as a, as a catastrophic disassembly and so on. These are the uh, few uh, few directions we are uh, trying to push our uh, results. Okay, uh, so uh, with that, I would like to stop. Uh, we have, uh, so, so, although I try to make it very simple, uh, it has, uh, it is highly complex because each system has to be characterized uh, in terms of molecular dynamic simulations to get uh, an idea about the weak interactions and so on. So we have a lot of collaborations, so especially the, uh, the, uh, the computational chemists, we try to collaborate with them to get uh, uh, more and more uh, structural insight. And as I mentioned, I showed you some beautiful uh, fluorescent microscope images, especially I just go back to show this here, these structures, you can see that this is two component system. Uh, there's a red component here and a green component here. So this is not simple confocal imaging. These are super resolution uh, fluorescence images. And you can see that uh, this is also characterization of the system is uh, very important. And uh, so uh, we collaborate with Sarit and uh, added them to extract some of these functions. Uh, uh, funding comes from uh, various sources and uh,
thank you for your kind attention i made the talk little shorter because uh, i just recovered from the covid and i am having some strain in my throat uh, i'm sorry for that and i hope uh, it's a it's a it's it is a highly complex subject i hope considering the diverse uh, audience i try to make it uh, very simple i hope i could convey the message uh, thank you very much for your attention i will be uh, looking through the questions and try to answer some of them yeah sure. uh, there are a few questions in the chat I'll mm -hmm. take up uh, the first one. If somehow we are able to remove any nuclear bases from the DNA, say mm -hmm. adenine or guanine, then what would be the possible application? Yeah, so uh, it's a good question. Uh, I, I'm like, uh, I've not talked about the biological structures. I talked mostly about the uh, synthetic structures. Uh, uh, so even, you see, I'm like for a synthetic chemist, even if you take out uh, one of the adenine or canine, uh, it creates a kind of uh, what we do in it. You, all of you know that about there is a DNA nanotechnology is going on. So these are with, uh, like uh, origamis and so on. So they are ideal building blocks. Okay. So even if it is not a, for a biological functions, they can be used as nice templates, molecular templates uh, to create uh, nanostructures like a DNA nanotechnology is one of the uh, emerging topics. So where one can use this kind of uh, sequence, which is not really ideal for biological structures, but artificial sequences, one can use it for uh, various functions. So that is possible. So that's one of the ways. Yeah. The, the, yeah. The, I don't see oh, any other. Oh. No, no, no. Uh, it has been shared with me. Yeah. yeah. So uh, the the second question is how the uh, supramolecular chemistry is mm -hmm. related to self healing materials. Wonderful question. So uh, yeah, I will I will go back to the uh, the I should have shown another video of a real self healing happens. So I'll just uh, go to this particular slide again. To explain you, suppose as I mentioned in supramolecular polymers, uh, so these are polymeric like structures and their monomers are uh, linked together by weak interactions, right? So, always what happens is the monomers always are in a kind of dynamic nature. What I mean by dynamic nature is monomer goes from the polymeric chain, can go out and come back. So, we call it as a monomer exchange dynamics huh? or there is a kinetics involved. That kinetics depends on the system. So sometimes uh, the dynamics happens in the microsecond time scale. Sometimes it takes hours. Okay. So suppose you are making a highly dynamic materials, which uh, the time scale is in the kind of second scale or something like that, uh, in the time scale of seconds. What happens is if there's a damage here, you break the material to two. But what happens is that this monomer can come back and self repair that damage. Okay. So that way, any dynamic. So so there are two types of self-healing, right? In classical way of self-healing is if you make a polymer, you embed uh, some catalyst inside that in a in a kind of glass bead, right? And then when the cracks comes, cracks meet that uh, beads, the it beads will open up, catalyst with polymerize, do the in-situ polymerization and self-heal. That's the way classically uh, polymers, in conventional polymers, the self-healing works. But if you look into the supramolecular polymers, you don't have to have a catalyst, right? Uh, that has a danger that uh, the crack has to meet the catalyst, then only the self healing happens. Here it is completely on dynamics of the molecules, just like nature. So what happens is if you have if you have a cut, this dynamics will help them to completely self heal uh, the polymer. Okay, so that way uh, that is that's the way self healing works. I should have showed a couple of videos, but you can just search it in YouTube. Uh, self healing polymers videos, you will definitely come across. Uh, uh, supramolecular polymer self healing videos. You will come across some nice YouTube videos. So that is that is a way. It's, it's a self healing. So tomorrow, uh, think about a car surface. I'm mean, like a car paint is cotton with these kind of self healing materials. Uh, you can imagine if there is a scratch, a simple uh, thermal annealing or something can completely uh, self heal the materials. So this is an uh, interesting applications of supramolecular polymers and self healing based on the dynamics of the molecule. Okay, so that that that's the beauty of the system, and this is exactly this dynamics only helping us to 
uh, for recyclable plastics. If you think about recyclable plastics, uh, so you can break these bonds since they are weak bonds. Uh, you can restore uh, these monomers at some whenever you want. So this is these are the two important concepts from a kind of application point of view uh, of the supramolecular polymers. One is as the self-healing materials, and the other one is as a kind of recyclable plastics. So these are the two two important direction. Uh, many people are many industries are trying to push it forward. Although our our attempt is more from a basic uh, research point of view. Uh, although we are having a one attempt to trying to make self healing materials, one project is going on. But more, uh, I did not talk about that today. Okay, uh, I'll take up the second last question. Uh, okay. Like we have seen renewable energy. Yeah. So I think the student must have read this thing somewhere. Uh, okay. What is renewable supramolecular polymeric materials? Okay. Is Wonderful. it anyhow related to renewable energy? I mean, that's the question. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, it's a wonderful question. Renewable energy, we know, all of us know. When it, uh, so when it comes to supramolecular polymers, the renewal uh, can have two different meanings, right? Either, so already think about a system uh, uh, which is completely recyclable. Okay, suppose if you are making a system uh, and you can go back to the starting material and completely reusable, if, if it is about just like a circular economy when it just comes to it. Uh, so it's, it's completely recyclable plastic. If you are able to make it, I don't think you have to talk about renewable sources, right? You don't have to talk about it because it's a completely recyclable plastic. And also there are supramolecular polymers, which are, uh, I, I would say that can be made from natural resources. There are certain uh, certain monomers can be also, uh, which can be not synthetic, which is kind of put natural uh, naturally available. So there are, I think, these are the two items. Once uh, once once you can talk about uh, renew uh, from a renewable energy uh, point of view or renewable sources, one can think about the polymers. But then uh, instead of doing that, I would say that make a supramolecular polymers, which is completely uh, economical to recycle it. Okay, so the classical polymers, the problem is, although classical polymers, people say that we can uh, reuse it, but the cost associated with it is not economical most of the time. Uh, that Because we know that polymer, uh, we all know that the polymer has to be segregated first. Uh, that's why we have resin identification system, you know, that one, two, three, four available in each, each polymer, if you look into the backside of the polymer. But then you have to, uh, you have to isolate, we have to collect it, we have to segregate, and then we have to recycle it. And most of the time, the cost involved in that process is much higher. So that's why uh, the recycling is not happening efficiently with most of the polymers. But uh, think about this kind of system. This kind of system is so simple that recycling becomes much more easier. But then it is a long way to go. Uh, this way that recyclable plastic concept is very emerging. Uh, like this is one of the, especially in Europe and uh, US, this is one of the most, uh, I'm like, uh, which can attract a lot of funding because the recyclable plastic is a kind of dream for all of us. Uh, so that can change the world. So the supramolecular polymers is a very ideal uh, candidate for that. Uh, so uh, instead of talking about renewable sources, I would say uh, completely recyclable plastics should be the direction to go. Okay, thank you. So I'll come to the last question. Uh, can you explain the difference between a hetero and a homometallic supramolecular cages? Okay, I did not talk about cages, which is uh, completely uh, outside uh, my thing. But then uh, uh, the question was homo and heterometallic cages, right? Exactly. Yes. Yeah. So it, I think it's it's very simple. Uh, definition is already there. It's a, a cage which has only one kind of metals, uh, which is constructed. For example, this is palladium cage uh, by created by Fujita. Uh, you can see that there is only one kind of metals are involved in the palladium. So that's why probably it's, it's a homo metal cage and the hetero metal cage should be having more than one metal. I think that's a simple definition should be the case. Okay. Okay. So thank you. Thank you very much, Professor George. And special thanks because uh, despite of down with COVID, you didn't postpone the talk and you kindly agreed to deliver the talk and take up all possible questions which have been shared by the uh, students and the faculty members through the chat. So on behalf of the National Academy of Sciences India Delhi chapter and the host institution, the Indiarupadhyay College, I would like to thank you once again. And also I would like to thank all the attendees for being there with us uh, today evening. 
we have the next session again on February 2nd, and that will be perhaps the second last or the penultimate session for this month-long series. Thank you very much, Professor George. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Bye-bye.